On July 17, 2014, radio contact with flight MH17 on route from Amsterdam to Kuala Lumpur suddenly broke off while the plane was flying over eastern Ukraine. The crash, in which none of the 298 people on board survived, sparked a widespread debate about flying civilian aircraft over war zones. It happened in the border region with Russia, which had been the subject of fierce fighting between Russian-backed militias and Ukrainian troops since April of that year. Extensive investigations were carried out and came to a clear result of what had happened. On the day of the crash, a Buk missile system was transported from Russia to Russian separatist-controlled Ukrainian territory. From there, the passenger plane was shot down, with the anti-aircraft missile exploding on the side above the cockpit. At the time of the crash, there were airspace limitations issued. This takes the form of a so-called NOTAM notice, which is issued by state authorities and informs pilots about hazards, warnings or restrictions. The airspace over eastern Ukraine was close to civilian aircraft, below 26,000 feet and in the area where the plane was shot down, airspace was blocked up to 32,000 feet. Flight MH17 fully complied with these limitations, as it was flying at an altitude of 33,000 feet when shot down. In the crash investigation, the incident was taken as an opportunity to look at the extent to which airspace restrictions are imposed in other conflict zones worldwide with 10 conflicts being studied for comparison. The decision-making process as to whether to fly in a conflict zone is structured as follows. First of all, the country that is flown over has the authority over its airspace and can impose airspace restrictions. In many countries, there are permanent areas that are close to civil aviation for various reasons, for example around military bases, in the vicinity of nuclear power plants, or around places of significant importance. It turned out that in nine of these conflict zones examined in the report, the airspace was not closed by local authorities. In two of these cases, however, including eastern Ukraine, the airspace was only open above a certain altitude. The report ultimately comes to the conclusion that there is a lack of incentives for nations to ensure the security of their airspace during an armed conflict. But the responsibility does not only lie with the country over which the aircraft is flown. It can also be the case that the airline's home country releases its own notices and restrictions. For example, the FAA, the United States agency that regulates civil aviation, can ban American operators from flying over certain areas abroad, even if the country in question would allow the plane to pass through. This is currently the case in Syria. Even though Syrian authorities have not closed their own airspace, US airlines are not allowed to fly over the country, even if they wanted to. These airspace limitations may well differ internationally, as is currently the case in Afghanistan. The US authority FAA prohibits US operators from entering Afghanistan's airspace, with just one exception for overflights along an airway in the east of the country via the mountainous Wakan Corridor. The German flight authority DFS in turn limits overflights of the country to a minimum altitude of 33,000 feet. At the time of the MH17 crash, US authorities had banned American operators from flying in the area surrounding the Crimean Peninsula. However, the Donbas region where the crash occurred was not part of this notice. Finally, it is of course also possible for airlines to carry out their own risk analysis and to avoid certain areas despite permission. However, they may not have the same level of intelligence information available as government agencies, and to voluntarily change their flights to longer routes is not in their economic interest. The investigation into MH17's crash ultimately concluded that none of the parties responsible recognized the risk. 
Since then, the airspace over eastern Ukraine has been closed, while the military conflict remained unresolved. Over the years, the war continues, with increasing direct intervention by the Russian military. Dozens of ceasefire agreements were concluded, none of which ultimately lasted. From March 2021 onwards, Russia then started two phases of massive troop deployments on the Russian-Ukrainian border and in Crimea, and ultimately began a full-scale invasion of Ukraine. And in addition to airspace closures due to security concerns, political sanctions now followed. One by one, countries began to close their airspace to all Russian aircraft, both airlines and private jets. First, in the UK, Poland, the Czech Republic, Romania, and Bulgaria. The pilots of Aeroflot flight SU-124 on the way from Moscow to New York were informed mid-flight that the Canadian airspace had been closed for Russian planes. They therefore had to turn back to Moscow via Norway, Sweden, and Finland. A few hours later, these countries also closed their airspace to Russian aircraft, and more countries followed. The ban leads to longer flight routes, which can be seen, for example, with the flights connecting Kaliningrad to Moscow. The Kaliningrad Oblast is an exclave of Russia, meaning it is a part of the country that is not directly connected to the rest of the country. While flight SU-1005, which connects Kaliningrad and Moscow daily, used to take a direct route via Lithuania and Belarus, it is now forced to take a detour, navigating over the Baltic Sea and the narrow gap of international airspace between Finland and Estonia. Transatlantic flights from Russia are also forced to take detours, such as flight SU-158 from Moscow to Cancun on March 7, which circumnavigated all of the closed airspaces. A little later, the airline that operates this flight, Aeroflot, which is the biggest one in Russia, had to suspend all international flights, except for those to Belarus. The reason for this, above all, isn't even the closed airspace, but an even greater concern for Russian airlines. Namely, that their aircraft, should they land anywhere abroad, could be confiscated as part of international sanctions. That is, because most of these planes are leased, which means that the aircrafts are not owned by the Russian airlines, but by private companies. Of all 980 passenger jets operated by Russian airlines, 515 jets are rented from companies outside of Russia. These planes alone have an estimated market value of around 10 billion US dollars. Many of the companies leasing such jets to Russian airlines are based in Ireland and Bermuda, and both of those countries have already announced that they would suspend all airworthiness certificates for Russian-operated planes. This means that a majority of Russian aircraft would soon be repossessed by their owners. In Russia, the reaction to this came in the form of a new law that actually allows the airlines to simply keep those planes. Accordingly, Russian airlines can re-register their leased aircraft, and the government will issue their own airworthiness certificates, which will allow these aircraft to continue flying within Russia. But even that could prove difficult, because the global aircraft manufacturers, Boeing, Airbus, and Embraer, have suspended their maintenance and technical support for Russian airlines as part of the international sanctions. This also applies to the delivery of spare parts, without which it will be hardly possible to maintain flight operations. But the sanctions are by no means one-sided. Russia reacted to the closure of airspace for Russian jets by also closing its airspace for airlines from 36 countries. And even operators from countries that are not yet blocked often avoid Russian airspace, such as all US airlines. Particularly affected by having to circumnavigate Russian airspace are the many busy routes between Europe and Asia. Since the regulations differ slightly from country to country, 
Let's take a closer look at Air France as an example. France is one of the countries where Russia has banned airlines from this country to fly over their territory. Ukraine has closed its airspace to all civilian air traffic since the invasion began. In addition, the French authorities are banning their airlines from flying over Belarus and Moldova. Due to the Syrian civil war, French authorities have ordered the country's airlines to also not fly over Syria. The same applies to Libya and Yemen. For Somalia, French authorities have set a minimum altitude requirement of 32,000 feet when overflying the country. The same applies to the southern and western border region of Sudan. For Iran, French authorities have stated that the west of the country should not be flown over and that flights in the east should keep a minimum of 32,000 feet. Iraq should also not be flown over, except for two eastern airways that also have to be taken with a minimum of 32,000 feet. That same requirement applies to an airway over eastern Afghanistan, while the rest of the country may not be flown over. And in Pakistan, a minimum altitude of 26,000 feet has to be kept. Looking at this map, it turns out that certain routes are out of the question, and two corridors emerge that connect Europe with Asia without restrictions. A northern route through the Black Sea, and a southern one through Saudi Arabia. For flights that up until recently went via Russia, this northern route is often the best option. An example is flight AF-112 from Paris to the South Korean capital Seoul. In the past, most of the flight route went through Russia. Now, the flight runs along the Black Sea until it can then take a more direct route. In some cases, the change of route even means flying the other way around the world, such as the case with Japan Airlines between Tokyo and London. As late as February, this connection flew west over Russia. But ever since March 4th, the airline flies northeast from Japan, via Greenland, towards the UK. It shows that the Russian invasion of Ukraine is having an enormous impact on routes across the globe. And it was this Russian war against Ukraine that already back in 2014 shook the aviation world when flight MH17 was shut down. The crash investigation that we discussed earlier, which was carried out by the Dutch authorities, was the most extensive such investigation ever carried out in the country. It was an enormous challenge, as the crash site was located in a contested area of a war zone. After all larger aircraft parts had been collected and analyzed in detail, the wreckage parts were reattached to a metal construction which clearly underlined the cause of the crash mentioned in the final report. I created a separate full-length video about this investigation into Flight MH17, which shows exactly how investigators managed to get an accurate and clear picture of the cause of the crash. Since in that video I also go into detail about the war situation at the time in the Donbass region and deal with specific details about this brutal conflict, it is unfortunately very likely that that video would never get monetized, and you probably would never see it. That's why I uploaded my full-length video about Flight MH17 to Nebula, where it can be seen alongside my other exclusive video. You will also find all my other videos there, completely ad-free, and there is further exclusive content from lots of amazing creators, such as Real Life Lore, Mustard, or Wendover Productions who, by the way, has made a fantastic video himself about how the international sanctions are affecting Russian airlines. The best way to get all this amazing content is definitely with the CuriosityStream Nebula bundle deal, which at current sales price is less than $15 a year to get full access to both sides. 
and Curiosity Stream has absolutely incredible documentaries, such as NYC Revealed, which in one episode takes a fascinating look on how New York City manages its airspace, which, served by three major airports, is considered the busiest airport system in the United States. So, not only do you get access to two full-fledged streaming sites, you also will support a variety of independent educational creators and enable me to make these extra videos for which the economics on YouTube just don't work out. So please make sure to click this button on screen right now or follow the link that's below in the description. Thank you so much for watching.